Well, good evening, everyone. I show six o'clock central time, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for joining us for our first uh, aviation weather workshop. Uh, my name is Jonathan Leffler. I'm the warning coordination meteorologist at the Aviation Weather Center. Uh, this workshop is a joint effort between three aviation offices in the Kansas City area, uh, AWC, uh, we have the Center Weather Service Unit in Olathe and the Weather Forecast Office uh, in Pleasant Hill. Uh, I'd like to give a special shout out to uh, the KC Aviators who have partnered with us in this endeavor. Uh, best special thanks go to uh, Chris and Evan for uh, helping us get this off the ground and really, really appreciate their support. A couple of housekeeping items as we get started here. Uh, because we've got a pretty large group of people attending already up to about 115, uh, we've got everyone's microphones muted, so we don't have any uh, additional background noise. Uh, but we do have the chat room open, so if you'd like to ask a question, just drop it into the chat. And we've got a couple of folks uh, monitoring that, and we'll do a couple of uh, Q&A sessions. Um, <clears throat> we have a pretty great lineup of uh, presenters this evening. Uh, we've got uh, a session for organization will be session one. And then we've got, uh, we'll transition over to uh, winter hazards in session two. So uh, again, thank you for joining us this evening. We hope you enjoy this workshop and that you find this information uh, very useful to you, uh, make you a little bit smarter when you go fly. And uh, with that, we'll get started with our first presenter, uh, Joey Welch. Well, thank you, Jonathan, and good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks again for joining us tonight. I know it's your evening, but uh, we appreciate your time. And uh, hopefully you can take some good, good tips away from the uh, presentation here. Uh, I'm Joey, I'm a AWC meteorologist. I've been here not very long, I got here in February of this past year. Uh, so still learning the ropes, but um, before that I was at the weather forecast office in Pleasant Hill, Missouri. Um, we serve the Kansas City area. And a lot of Northwest Missouri into Central Missouri, a tiny sliver of Eastern Kansas. And I was there for six years. And before that I was in the private weather sector in uh, Houston, uh, Rockwell Collins. I think they have a new name now, but um, I was an aviation meteorologist there for about a year and a half right after I uh, graduated school. And uh, going back further from that, I was an in-flight refueler uh, in the Air Force on the KC-135. Uh, and that's what really got me into weather, strangely enough. Um, I was already in the aviation, uh, but I was at McConnell Air Force Base in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, so go ahead and uh, slide there. So we'll take a quick look at the WFO operations, uh, the weather forecast office uh, operations as a whole. Uh, there are 122 offices spread throughout the CONUS. Um, and we'll take a quick look at what each office does. Um, you'll see on the map what looks like tiny puzzle pieces. Um, this is basically the area of responsibility for each office. Uh, the one I worked at was in Pleasant Hill there in the middle of the country. Um, and you can kind of see where you're at and what office serves you. And feel free to visit their website, their social media outlets, and you know get up to date weather information. They do provide more insights into weather forecasts and timing and specific hazards, more so than a weather app can do. Um, so if you go to weather.gov, uh, that's where you'll see a map of the US. You can click on your particular area or click on your zip code and, and basically get a very tailored forecast. So there's a ton of information. We don't have time to go through it all, but we'll kind of show you what we do as a whole uh, in the weather service from the weather forecast office perspective. Uh, slide. So typically at each office, there are two forecasters on duty, uh, and these uh, individuals are on duty 24-7, uh, 365 days a year. Uh, staffing does increase during severe weather events, but there will always be at least two forecasters on duty uh, serving in one of two roles, uh, which are interchangeable. Everybody's trained the same and you can switch in and out as you uh, as you please. Uh, the first of which is the forecast desk, uh, basically in which the forecaster will produce a seven day forecast uh, among a variety of other forecast products, which we'll discuss here in a little bit. Uh, the other and relatively newer role is that of the impact based decision support desk. Uh, responsible for basically communicating the forecast uh, to, get to the government, to media partners, and to the general public as a whole. Uh, slide. So in the IDSS communicator role, uh, that forecaster is uh, taking weather, weather observations every six hours, they're answering phone calls, they're updating forecast graphics that are issued on social media and more official graphic 
products uh, that are issued to government partners available on our website. Uh, during significant weather, however, they are conducting interviews, uh, not all the time, but a lot of times uh, news, uh, news crews will come to the office or they may catch us during a tornado survey, things like that, where we'll conduct an interview and give critical updates to either ongoing weather hazards or things that have happened you know, in the recent past. Um, a lot of times they will staff uh, command centers on site for big events. Uh, you know, for example, during hurricane events or even during annual events like air shows. Uh, I know when I was at Pleasant Hill, we did a lot of NASCAR activities at the uh, Kansas Speedway. Uh, one of the other big things we did was the uh, Missouri State Fair each year. And there are a lot of cases where severe weather was coming in and there were ongoing concerts and we would provide critical updates to decision makers. And sometimes they would have to cancel or delay um, major activities and not, not everybody was happy but we were there to protect life and property so it's it's a pretty new thing that we're doing but um but it's a uh, it's well received and, and we'll continue to do that in the uh in the near future uh, slide the other forecaster on duty uh produces the the routine forecast that goes out to seven days uh they also uh, provide aviation forecasts uh, in the form of criminal aerodrome forecasts or tasks as you as you know them uh, and we'll look at that here in detail in a bit uh, they also produce fire weather forecasts uh, highlighting conditions favorable for wild sp wildfire spreading uh, flood forecasts flood warnings um, severe weather warning operations as well um, again during severe weather staffing is typically be beefed up with at least one forecaster on radar issuing warnings uh, there are others who take storm reports. Uh, some communicate with the Red Air forecaster on storm trends. Um, some issue the routine forecast products that still need to go out even during severe weather operations. Uh, and finally, there's a coordinator who kind of oversees staffing needs. Usually that's a manager, uh, but there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen during severe weather operations. Uh, we can have up to six to eight um, during major events like hurricanes. Those areas can be staffed up even more. Uh, but it, at the very minimum, there's always two forecasters on duty. Slide, please. So we'll take a brief look at TAFs and, and how they can serve you. Um, each office issues forecasts for specific airports, generally for a 24-hour period. Uh, these are updated at least every six hours and more often if conditions change rapidly over a short amount of time. So if we look at this example here in the upper left, uh, this is for Kansas City International. Uh, you can find on each line of the forecast basically wind direction and speed, uh, visibility is next, uh, ceiling heights, which are your cloud bases, uh, weather types, and low level wind shear if it's present. Uh, each subsequent line represents a change in flight category uh, or the addition or removal of weather and any significant change in wind direction and or speed. Uh, so we, we you know, send out the forecast every six hours, but we may adjust the forecast two or three times in between the forecasts. So we wanna make sure you guys get the most up-to-date forecast um, as, as we can possibly possibly give you. Um, and we also keep in mind category minimums, which do vary depending on each airport uh, that you're, you're located at. Slide, please. So along with the TAF itself, the forecast will write up a brief discussion, basically providing a synopsis of the forecast along with any uncertainty in that forecast. So you can kind of get your insight into what the forecaster was thinking when they issued that TAF. Uh, these are updated the same time we update a TAF. Uh, maybe not so much if we do a quick amendment, but at least every six hours, these are going to be issued. Um, they're tailored to aviation needs and are typically short enough to be read during radio communications. And you can find the area forecast discussion or AFD, as we call it, on our webpage. Uh, aviationweather.gov underneath the forecast tab uh, there you can you can kind of see it above Montana there if you click on that forecast tab uh, you'll be able to see a drop down menu and then you'll see the, the option to select aviation forecast uh, discussions slide please and that concludes the weather forecast operation side of things and next up is Chelsea Kenyon at the city of BSU all right, thanks, Joey. Um, my name is Chelsea Kenyon. I'm at the Center Weather Service Unit here in Kansas City. We're located at the Air Traffic Center in Olathe. 
and uh, we are kind of the middlemen between the local uh, aviation forecasters at the forecast office here in Pleasant Hill and the national forecasters at the Aviation Weather Center. So we kind of fill more of a regional role. And uh, so next slide, please. We'll kind of detail how this, this all works. So all of the Center Weather Service units or CWSUs are co-located with the air traffic center. So we actually work with the air traffic controllers. In fact, I sit next to the air traffic controllers every day. Um, so part of our job is to provide them with forecasts with any kind of lead time on any particular problems that may be uh, coming their way. Say thunderstorms are about to hit Chicago or um, thunderstorms are going to be blocking a, a large portion of our airspace, severe turbulence moving in out of the Rockies, uh, mountain waves, any of those kinds of things are things that we're looking for and trying to advise the air traffic controllers about them so that they can have a plan in place to make sure that they can get the volumes of air traffic around those hazards. So uh, as you can see uh, there, Kansas City is right smack in the middle. And we have a lot of neighbors around us. So we do a lot of collaboration and coordination with our surrounding centers. Uh, we feed Chicago all day long. So that's a big part of what we do. So there are days when I'm actually more focused on Chicago weather than I am on Kansas City weather, because it's such a big impact to our operation. Uh, we do a lot of work with Denver and Dallas-Fort Worth. And then on the midships, uh, the overnight hours, that's when the, the cargo operations are going. So we deal with Indianapolis and Memphis quite a bit because UPS and FedEx fly through our airspace from the West Coast to get to those airports at night. Um, so you can see on the, the inset map there, um, that's kind of a, a picture of our low altitude sectors. So the trails area is right around the Kansas City area. So that's where we are. And so when you take off out of the Kansas City area, and you're talking to Kansas City Center, you're going to be talking to the trails uh, air traffic controllers. So and they're all good. I can give them a th thumbs up. Uh, next slide, please. So you might wonder why we are actually with the air traffic controllers instead of in our own office. Uh, we've actually been doing this for over 40 years. Uh, we started in 1978 as a response to an aircraft accident that happened in Georgia. And what had happened is the flight took off. I think it was from Atlanta going to like Birmingham. They went through some weather, but it wasn't too bad. On the return trip, it had formed a complete squall line. And they didn't realize how bad it was going to get. And they tried to go through the line and lost both engines, crashed, broke up, and uh, there was a significant loss of life. And one of the things that the NTSB determined after that investigation was that the air traffic controllers at the center needed more uh, expertise at their disposal, at their disposal um, to know when that line of thunderstorms was going to become too solid to get air traffic through. Um, so that's when the CWC program was uh, initiated, and we've been right there in the in the thick of it with the air traffic controllers ever since. So we've been doing this impact-based decision support kind of thing for 40 years. Um, and we, we take great pride in the fact that we can help them um, keep the, airs, the airways safe. Uh, next slide, please. So we are actually there only 16 hours a day, even though the center is open 24 hours. Uh, we don't work overnight because that's mostly cargo. They have their own meteorologists, so we try and give them a good briefing before we leave and hope they're not mad at us in the morning. Um, but briefings, we brief people all day long. So we have some scheduled briefings that we do throughout the day to let controllers know what to expect for their shift, the traffic planners to know uh, where, the, where the problems spots are going to be. Uh, we also do a lot of on-demand briefings. So anytime things are coming up, especially during the thunderstorm season, um, anytime anybody needs to know when is that hole going to close in between those two cells, what time is that going to hit that airport, um, how bad is the turbulence going to be, uh, we answer those kinds of questions all day long. So we're there in case something happens and they need that information right away. We also do a recorded briefing three times a day, and that's for the air traffic controllers themselves. Before they take an operational position, we want to make sure that they know about the weather and what to expect for their shift. So all of the center air traffic controllers view that, and we also provide that for the terminals that are underlying our facility. So um, Kansas City TRACON at the tower, St. Louis TRACON, Wichita, Springfield, um, all of those controllers are seeing the same briefing. So they all um, get at least a basic weather understanding before they start controlling traffic for the day. We do a lot of collaboration as well, uh, down to the local level with the forecast office. So we actually collaborate on the TAF for uh, Kansas City. 
twice a day at least, sometimes more. And then we also do that for St. Louis. Um, and we are available to any of the forecast offices if they need a little extra aviation knowledge or have a question about how something might impact uh, their area. We also collaborate upward to the national level um, with the Aviation Weather Center and the meteorologists at the FAA Command Center in Washington, DC. So that's especially important during thunderstorm season when we're all trying to figure out how to get everybody from point A to point B through a massive line of thunderstorms. We need to make sure we're all on the same page. So being able to talk to them and making sure we're all telling the same story to the controllers who have to make decisions about that uh, we want to make sure that everybody understands how we expect it to play out. Um, the one product that we issue is the Center Weather Advisory. That's the only public product that we put out from the center that you would actually see as pilots. Um, and that can really be for anything. Most often it'll be for thunderstorms, um, but it can also be for turbulence, icing, IFR conditions, anything that's not covered in another advisory, or if we want to bring a, uh, enhanced awareness to something, say, severe uh, icing and freezing rain. We could issue that on top of an air mitt for icing to show that there's an enhanced risk in a particular area. So we kind of have free reign to, to make that product be whatever it is we need to be. It's our Swiss Army knife. Uh, we also provide a lot of uh, graphics and forecast products for the air traffic controllers within our facility and the terminals. So we do a lot of graphics, but you won't see them unless you go onto our website, which is weather.gov slant DKC. And you have access to all of that on the web. So you're free to look at that at any time. And you can also see our recorded briefing there as well. During the thunderstorm season, we also participate in what's called the TCF chat. So that is the uh, traffic Flow Management Convective Forecast, which is an acronym within an acronym. And so we do that from March through October. Every two hours we get into a chat room. I think uh, the AWC folks will talk about that a little bit later, but um, that's mainly a thunderstorm season thing that we do, but that becomes the basis for the air traffic plan for the entire national airspace system. So we are able to c contribute in that way and make sure that how things are evolving in our airspace are represented. So that's a, it's kind of nice to have a little bit of a say in what happens at the national level. We also do a lot of uh, training for the air traffic controllers. A lot of it is seasonal. We also do kind of a, an introductory weather session with new controllers as they're coming out of the academy. So we have a lot of training ongoing. And unlike the forecast office, we work by ourselves. There's just one of us on shift at any given time. So if it's gonna be a busy day, it's on us. And if it's gonna be a slow day, we're gonna enjoy that. So thunderstorm season is really the busiest time for us. Uh, we don't pull in extra people when we know it's gonna be busy. We just prioritize our duties. Uh, next slide, please. So we wanted to kind of show this and you can probably uh, pull it up and go ahead and, and play the video here. Uh, this is just an example of how air traffic flows through our airspace. So Kansas City is kind of the long skinny one there in the middle and the little uh, tadpole looking things are actually airplanes with the tracks on them. And so you can see, I think this starts fairly early in the morning, so it's slow, but then you can see as traffic picks up throughout the day, um, and there's a little bit of weather there. So you can see how they go in and around the weather, what the flows are into Chicago, into Dallas, um, down into uh, Denver as well. So those are kind of our major three airports that we feed all day long. We also have uh, the transcontinental flows. So those are gonna be the, the west coast to east coast and east coast to west coast flows. Um, that has taken a significant hit during COVID for us because the east coast, there's no business travelers, so it's been much, much slower. But uh, those regional flows into Dallas and Denver and Chicago have really kept us busy. So uh, there are some days when Kansas City Center is actually busier than New York. Um, which has been kind of an odd, odd thing for us. Uh, we also do a lot of uh, ski country routes during the winter time, heading up to Aspen, Eagle, uh, those areas. And then we handle a lot of Atlanta traffic down into Florida as well. Um, all the snowbirds heading south for the winter. So uh, those kind of routes are gonna still be there, I think for this winter. So, uh, but you can see how they have to kind of uh, shuck and jive around the, the areas of thunderstorms. You don't wanna be the controller sitting at the end of that line, having to, handle all the deviations around the end of a line, um, that can get really, really busy really quickly. So it's my job to tell them where that line's gonna stop, or if it's a solid line, if there's gonna be a hole anywhere in that line, it's my job to tell them where it is so that they can prepare for that. 
Um, so hopefully those controllers ate their Wheaties that day. But uh, you can see how busy we can get there in the middle of the country, especially when the weather is blocking other places. So um, a lot of times it can funnel them right into us. Sometimes it can actually keep them out of our airspace. So uh, weather is really important to the air traffic controllers in terms of how busy uh, we're going to be. So that's just one example. And I think uh, now I'll turn it over to Amy. Hey, thanks Chelsea very much. Um, um, a reminder, um, if you have a question that you wanna ask, um, go ahead and put that into the chat, um, not under the questions board, but under the chat on the right-hand side and make sure that uh, you have it set to the entire audience so we can all see the question. And then during the question and answer session, we'll be able to, to share them and answer them uh, for you. Um, so my name is Amy McPherson. I am a senior meteorologist at the Aviation Weather Center, and I've been here for about uh, six years in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, prior to that, I've been a forecaster at um, weather forecast offices in Washington, D.C., and California, Minnesota, South Dakota. So I've been all over the country, and I've been very fortunate to be able to do that with my career and be exposed be able to experience all sorts of types of, of weather and become sort of a weather expert of, uh, you know, anything from marine to tropical to, um, and now to aviation, which I really enjoy. Okay, next slide. Okay, first off, the Aviation Weather Center is kind of our national scale perspective of en route aviation weather forecasting. And then we also have an international branch as well, which we'll get into um, a little bit about the history of the AWC. Um, it, here in Kansas City, initially the Aviation Weather Unit from the Air Force joined what was then called uh, Severe Local Storms or CELS, which is now called SPC or Storm Prediction Center, and then also the Kansas City Weather Bureau Office in Kansas City, um, downtown in the federal building. And that is now the Weather Forecast Office in Pleasant Hill. So then in 1978, the Convective Sigma unit was established, and that was also in response to that same airline crash that uh, Chelsea referenced back on April 4th, 1977. So that was Again, uh, in response and um, the, the the pilots, the onboard radar was not able to see this the uh, the uh, solid line of convection that they were headed towards. They thought there was a hole that they could get through, but there there was not. Um, and so they established the convective segment units so that you know they would have more um, more resources to to check up on. Um, whether or not it was safe to fly through a convective area. And then in 1982, um, the National Aviation Weather Advisory Unit was formed, and we actually have a forecaster still um, at the, that we work with at the Aviation Weather Center that was there when the, the Newau, as he said it's pronounced, um, was, was formed. Um, he is still working uh, to, uh, rotating shifts there at the AWC. Um, and has been since 1982. And then in 1995, um, the National Severe Storms Forecast Center did become the Storm Prediction Center, and then Newau becomes the Aviation Weather Center. And then finally, it moved to our current location, which is closer to um, MCI Airport. And we are also co-located co with uh, Central Region Headquarters and uh, the National Weather Service Training Center in this building there. Okay, next slide. And uh, no November 4th, 1992, uh, it was written into law that uh, we shall be established in the Kansas City, Missouri area, the Aviation Weather Center. And so um, we uh, will continue to be a part of Kansas City's future. And that picture there is a bunch of us that, you know, are current employees there at the Aviation Weather Center. And that was right after the Chiefs won the World Series and we're all excited, but before the pandemic started. So. <laughs> okay, next slide. So we have two branches at the Aviation Weather Center. We have the Domestic Operations Branch, and that consists of five desks. Um, the, there's a desk 
um, dedicated to convective SIGMETs, one to TCF, which again is the traffic flow management convective forecast, uh, one for the turbulence, and one for icing, and one for clouds and visibility. So for domestic operations, um, we're talking about the CONUS, uh, the lower 48, and the surrounding nearshore waters or coastal waters. What we do um, on these desks, because we issue uh, segments, whether for convection or turbulence or icing or blowing dust, if you're on the IFR uh, clouds and vis visibility desk. Um, so those are our aviation warnings. Um, and then we have um, advisories and forecasts that we do as well. So every six hours we issue a new set of aramets, which is our sort of advisory, um, a little bit uh, lower grade than a segment, but still areas of moderate or greater um, hazards. And then we do have the TFM convective forecast, which is the TCF. And that's more of a planning uh, convective forecast for uh, national traffic flow management um, so that's used on a, on a national scale and then sometimes more on a local scale if um, it's, uh, thunderstorms are affecting traffic coming in and out of major airports. And that again runs through um, March through October um, during the more active convective season. And then finally, we also do a low level significant weather uh, graphic and that has two snapshots at 12 hours out from the current time and then 24 hours out from the current time. And that shows um, areas where we're expecting low level turbulence, um, IFR and MVFR conditions, and then also the current or the, um, the freezing levels um, at that time at 12 hours and 24 hours out. We collaborate a lot. We're constantly on chat uh, with our partners. Um, that includes the CWSUs, so we're chatting with Chelsea a lot um, and also meteorologists at airlines and also um, the FAA command center a lot where we're chatting with them just so that we make sure everyone's on the same page. We're sending the same message out, a consistent message that you, know, you as the user can, can get and understand clearly what we're, what we're trying to say and what we're trying to warn about. Okay, the next slide. Is it working? There you go. <laughs> okay, and then the other branch at the Aviation Weather Center had it consists of three desks, and that's the International Operations Branch. We have the Tropical Desk, um, the SIG Weather North Desk, and the SIG Weather South Desk, which are global graphics desks. So first, with the Tropical, um, with the Tropical, they are they issue SIGMETs for much of the North Atlantic and also much of the North Pacific, all the way out to boundaring areas um, of Japan's airspace, and then also our co cohorts in, uh, in Honolulu and also Alaska. So we're, we're coordinating with them a lot out in the North Pacific. But we issue SIGMETs there for convection, um, oceanic SIGMETs for convection, turbulence, icing, volcanic ash, and um, tropical cyclones. Um, and then, for um, as far as uh, forecasts for um, for the tropical desks, we also write uh, text area forecasts for the Gulf and the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean. So those are just uh, written out um, text of, of um, information, especially useful for um, yeah for um, the tourist industry there in, in the Caribbean. And also for helicopter pass um, in the Gulf with, uh, with the oil rigs out there. Um, and then for the uh, global graphics desks, we have two forecasters, one that takes um, care of the Northern Hemisphere and one that takes care of the Southern Hemisphere. And they are drawing charts for 24 hours out um, mainly for transatlantic flights. Um, so 24 hour forecasts for jet streams, convection, turbulence, tropopause heights, um, active volcanoes and tropical cyclones. So again, and, and so mostly um, high level type of um, type of weather hazards for 
uh, transatlantic flights. Um, and then also with the Global Meteorological Services, we are coordinating every day. We have a chat up with the UK, Canada, Brazil, Australia, New Zealand, Guam, Hawaii, and, and Taiwan. So we are constantly coordinating our global weather graphics um, and our global forecasts so that, again, we are consenting consistent messages. And then we're also ensuring that we have seamless transitions of SIGMETs from one air one airspace, um, let's say uh, the Japanese Meteorological Agency as an area of convection is coming into um, the, the North Atlantic airspace that we take care of, that we are coordinating with them so that there is a seamless transition and, and that um, that weather is, is warned uh, for those flights. Okay, next slide. You have the next slide. There you go. <laughs> and then a couple of other, um, so we're a national center. There's a couple other of national centers that you're probably familiar with. Um, oh, we went one too many. Let me go back one slide. There we go. Uh, the Storm Prediction Center, uh, you're probably familiar with. Um, every day they have outlooks, 24-hour uh, outlooks for um, what they expect for areas of severe weather for the day. They also are the ones that issue the tornado tornado and severe weather watches. Um, so they have those hazardous weather outlooks. They have a whole plethora of information that you can look into as far as, you know, just really getting into the nitty gritty of met mesoscale guidance for, um, for severe weather to initiate and grow and also um, a plethora of other hazardous weather forecasts. But I know a lot of people go there just to see for their, an overview for the day of where you know where convection and where thunderstorms are expected and where's the most severe thunderstorms expected for the day um, another great source is the weather weather prediction center um, where you have weather analysis and forecast products um, so you have this is more surface based where you have your fronts and your um, high pressure and low pressures and troughs all analyzed at the surface but also you can find there the upper level charts um, and then you can also see that they have areas of precipitation that are expected um, during that time. So you'll, you can see future, um, future analysis of, of the fronts and the precipitation um, on their website as well. Um, I believe we have the, all, of, all of that linked on our website, aviationweather.gov as well. Okay, next slide. All right, so at the Aviation Weather Center, we are very dependent um, on pilot, uh, pilot reports. Um, those are things that really help us decide whether or not our forecast is going in a, a good, di good direction or not. It's a great tool for us. So while we have satellite and we have the model data and we have the radar and we can really make a, a really good um, assessment of what's happening, and make sure and, and have our forecast out based on the, that information. When we get an actual report that turbulence is happening in an area where we have forecasted turbulence, that really gives us the confidence in our forecast and, and to keep going. And if we get something outside of an area that we have not forecast, then that might you know have us look into it a little bit deeper and might need to adjust our forecast to include an area that you know we weren't expecting turbulence, but turbulence was was there and the way we do that is through pilot reports so you can help us out a lot um, and the entire aviation community of course by going and uh, registering for an account on aviationweather.gov and becoming more knowledgeable with um, the correct information and formatting and the decoders decoders for the pilot uh, pilot reports um, and then you can submit those pilot reports right through our website um, there at aviationweather.gov slash pirate slash submit. And uh, there will be two forms options, the full and the dispatcher form. So this is the full version. And this one just uh, helps you out a little bit um, if you're not familiar with entering PIREPS. 
Um, so it, it kind of helps you out make sure is that make sure that everything is decoded uh, properly and correctly so that when it comes into our system, we understand what exactly what you're trying to say um, say to us. And then the other form is just a dispatcher version. And these are this is for people that know what they're doing. They just want to get the pilot report out really quick and, and help us out. And all those pilot reports go to our website. They go to, you know, all of us um, into our weather database systems so that it pops up and we can see what is happening um, almost immediately once you submit the report. And they're, like I, I said, they're incredibly helpful, something that we use every day. So the more the better for us. Okay. And finally, um, I just want to talk a little bit about um, the National Weather Service has a program called Weather Ready Nation um, Ambassador Program. And this is about um, readying communities um, for hazardous weather events. So organizations can become an ambassador and um, by doing so, you're kind of you're committing to helping your organization be prepared and respond to hazardous weather. So the goal of the Weather Ready Nation Ambassador Program is to have a nation that is ready, responsive, and resilient to hazardous weather. And it's a really great way to um, strengthen partnerships um, between us, the government agencies, the aviation community, and the users and the pilots. And uh, you know we love our we love our ambassadors and we love our our partners and um, this is a great way for us to maintain that partnership and strengthen it. So if you'd like to know more about uh, becoming a Weather Ready Nation ambassador, just go to weather.gov/wrn. And with that, I think we'll move on to questions. All right, good evening, everybody. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the presentation so far going over our organizational um, overview. So we've got Jimmy, Chelsea, and Amy are gonna stay on here uh, with me. We've got a couple questions, and so I'll kind of, uh, I'll go through what I've gotten so far and the person who was in charge of that specific area, or you know, maybe if any other ones wanna jump in, they can do that. Um, I'm Amanda Martin. I also work at the Aviation Weather Center. I've been there for um, six years as well. I also have previous uh, weather experience. I was at the Albuquerque Forecast Office for five years prior to coming to the AWC. Um, aviation was always an interest of mine, and it was just a and more whenever I got to the Forecast Office. So I'm really enjoying my time at the AWC, and I love forecasting. Uh, for aviation and just how different it is from um, the public side. Uh, but anyway, we'll go ahead and get into the question. So the first one is going to be for you, Jimmy. Um, they're asking if any of the WFOs have forecasters dedicated to aviation. Well, New York or Atlanta. Yes, there are some of the bigger sites, I believe Chicago, Atlanta, um, I know they do uh, have actual aviation that just dedicate to those jobs. Here, I'm at the Pleasant Hill WFO. I've had a little bit sick this week, so Joey was uh, nice enough to do the briefing for me. But uh, so it, there are there are some offices that do have uh, aviation that's just dedicated to that. But at each WFO, um, we are assigned aviation depending on what your duties are that day so when i go into work later tonight if i take the forecaster shifts i will be dedicated to aviation and then also all the other forecasting stuff so it is one of the things you will dedicate yourself to uh, when you do create the tasks thank you jimmy um we've got another one for you about tasks um asking that they understand that some WFOs issue new TAFs more often than every six hours, even if amendment criteria isn't reached. Is it true? And if so, which offices are doing that? I do believe some offices do do it a little bit uh, more. It's the bigger offices. I think it's Chicago, Atlanta, the ones that do the 30 hour TAFs um, that do that. But we're constantly watching the TAFs at every WFO, no matter where you're at. Um, and if we see any of that criteria that you saw on that slide change, we will amend the TAF and we try to keep that TAF as accurate as possible. 
um, live. All we're always monitoring the conditions at the different airports, and so we, if we see something go out of category, we will amend immediately. So that does happen. And if I could just add, uh, St. Louis is one office that does do a 30-hour tap for St. Louis Lambert, and they have a mandatory every three hours amendment. So. Um, the bigger airports, uh, the top 50 airports, top 30 airports are going to have uh, more more frequent amendments that are required. Thank you, Jimmy and Chelsea. Um, the next one, Amy or myself can answer, um, is where are the graphical forecasts for aviation produced? Amy, do you want to go ahead? Okay. Um, grass Graphical forecasts for aviation produce. I, I'm assuming the GFA or uh, the graphics that we produce ourselves. Um, the GFA um, is on our website. Um, I don't know if I can share my screen, but um, if you go- uh, I, can, um, I can go ahead and answer that on, okay. on the, uh, the question, but yeah, the, the GFA is produced at the AWC. Yeah, it's produced at the AWC, but if you go to our website on, under um, hold on just a minute, under tools, the GFA tool is where you can find it on our on our website. But yes, that is produced um, through a, a plethora of model data um, on our website. Okay. Um, the next one I think is will be good for Chelsea. It says, uh, during a flight, when I give a pie rep to a controller, do they pass it on to you? Absolutely. So I highly recommend giving pilot reports to controllers, especially if you don't have access in the, in the cockpit uh, to do it right then. That's part of the controller's duties. They're required to uh, solicit and to disseminate pilot reports. So especially bases and tops reports, if you're going into an airport and you're talking to the center and they're doing approach services for that airport, they're actually required to solicit uh, one bases and tops report every hour. And part of my job is to make sure that they know when we're meeting the criteria. Basically, it's uh, below 5,005. So if any airport is below 5,005, they should be getting basis and tops reports. So feel free to give them your reports. And the nice thing about that is they're already staring at your information. They already know your aircraft type. They already know your altitude and they already know your call sign. So all you have to do is tell them the weather. Um, it's best to keep it brief, of course, when you're talking to air traffic control, but they, they can very easily enter that in. It goes to our flight data system and they will process it and send it out to everybody. So we we also rely very heavily on pilot reports and we strongly encourage you to pass them on. Okay, we've got a whole slew of questions coming in now. Um, so I think we're gonna have to answer just a couple more um, in regards to the time. We're already a little bit over for our session, but we'll go ahead and see if we can get um, a couple more in and then I'll try and answer them throughout. Um, so the next question is, um, I don't really think we have too much on this one. They're asking about um, near future upgrades to the aviation program in general, EWSU's AWC new products or services, um, smoke tracking, um, and that the, uh, the HER was valuable with the 2020 summer fire season. Um, I think we're constantly working every year. We have um, two two times a year, usually we have our aviation weather test beds where we all come together um, from the AWC. We have our support branch, um, uh, research and development forecasters. We have um, CWSU, meteorologist, weather forecast offices. Um, we're all working on um, getting, you know, pilots and our, our customers what they need. Um, we just need to know what it is. So if you want to, you know, send an, an email to our webmaster, you know, we need to know what it is so that we can uh, uh, keep up. And we're constantly trying to make sure that we're getting the best product out to you guys. I don't know if you guys have anything else to say on that. I think one of the biggest things from the CWCU perspective has been our new satellites. Uh, that have gone up in the last few years, and the Global Lightning Mapper, which is providing um, much much more extensive coverage of lightning, both in cloud and cloud to ground and, and, and everything in between. So that's been really helpful for us, and there's going to be new GLM products that are rolling out uh, to users, and, and you will be able to, to access more of that data very soon, and I think that'll be really helpful during the thunderstorm season. 
Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, so let's see. Okay, so we have a question about flying into in uh, IMC and the biggest concern being thunderstorms, embedded thunderstorms. So we're gonna go ahead and hit that in the next um, half of the presentation that's going over hazards. Um, so I'll save that one, maybe we'll answer it next time. And let's see. Okay, sorry, you guys are coming in fast. I'm trying to read them all. <laughs> So uh, when will the legacy text airmet be retired given that G airmets have been the primary issuance for over a decade? Um, in fact, you can't find a graphical version of the time smeared text airmet on the AWC website. So that's definitely been talked about a lot at the AWC. Um, I don't know, Amy, do you have any or, or Chelsea, any ideas on, on a... <laughs> It's been talked about. I'll just say that. What I can't see the question. What was the question again? Retiring the text air mats. Oh, text air mats. No, I think um, that's a requirement from the FAA to have those. So um, probably not anytime soon. Um, we have the graphical air mats too. So I think it's just they're they're just auto. Um, we don't type them out by hand. They're just auto um, generated. So. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and close out this first q and I'm gonna try and answer some of your questions that came in um, just uh, so that we can try and get a little bit back on schedule and get this thing continued. So thank you guys for your questions. Keep them coming in. I'll, I'll be watching them and uh, trying to get them answered as fast as I can. Yeah, thank Jonathan? you. Jonathan? Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda, for that. I really appreciate the help on the, the Q&A piece. And uh, thank you also, uh, Amy and, and Chelsea and Jimmy for answering some of those questions. So I uh, want some contact information at the end of the presentation. So if there are uh, questions that you have and we didn't get to it, uh, then we'll certainly uh, follow up with you. But so hang tight. We've got a lot of really good stuff coming up next. Uh, this will be session two. This is more about the uh, winter weather hazards. Uh, we've got uh, three presenters lined up for this one. We'll talk about some icing, turbulence, uh, ceiling visibility, and precipitation concerns that you may have in the winter. Uh, notice some of the questions in there coming in about uh, icing conditions and whatnot. So uh, we'll hopefully try to answer those. And again, if we don't get to it, uh, we'll have contact information at the end. So you're more than welcome to follow up with us. So uh, with no further ado, we'll get started off with uh, Mitch Sego to take care of icing. Off to you, Mitch. There, I should be unmuted now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I was just saying that I've had a cold, so if I'm wheezing a little bit or coughing some, uh, please bear with me. Um, I should be okay for the most part, though. Um, I'm Mitch Sego, and um, I've been at AWC uh, here in Kansas City for um, about three years. Prior to that, I was up in Alaska in Anchorage, uh, at what is called the AWU or the Alaska Aviation Weather Unit. Um, and I spent uh, just over five years up there. Um, and then before that, I actually was in broadcasting. I spent a few years up in Anchorage on, on TV. So um, I've done a little bit with, uh, with both sides in, uh, in front of the camera and behind. So, all right, next slide. So uh, I'm gonna be talking about um, icing, which, Sounds like we've already had some questions on this, of course, can be a, a, a pretty potent threat. Um, here's a couple of pictures in case you haven't run across icing before. Uh, it gives a nice visual of what is, is going on um, of some, uh, some different icing types. Uh, and, <clears throat> excuse me, on the left there, you see um, uh, an example of some rhyme icing. And I'm gonna go through these in a little bit more detail on the next slide. Some clear icing. Um, looks like kind of an extra skin on the fuselage there in the, in the center and then kind of a uh, kind of a chunky conglomerate or a uh, maybe some freezing rain perhaps in this picture and some mixed in uh, the picture on the right. So let's get into talk a little bit about uh, the different types of icing and uh, in, in, in some of the components with them. We'll head to the next slide. 
So as I, as I said earlier, um, one that we see in, in most pyreps is rime ice. This is a type of ice actually that occurs uh, right around 70% of the time. It's the most common. And it's essentially where a, a water droplet freezes very quickly and in doing so it will trap air in it. Um, and so when it hits an aircraft, it becomes more brittle and more opaque. It has kind of a milky color to it. <coughs> Pardon me. But, uh, but nonetheless, it can, it can have some pretty big impacts. Um, clear ice is probably the bigger threat. Uh, uh, same, similar type of process, but instead of trapping as much air, the, the droplet will typically be um, larger many times, um, and it will smear across the aircraft. It's less opaque, therefore, and it can certainly be more dense. Uh, so that is a, that is a um, can be a severe threat if we, if we see that. A, a, an example of clear icing is freezing rain. So, um, and of course, freezing rain is something you don't want to get in the middle of um, if you're up in, a, in an aircraft. Then we've got mixed um, combination of clear and rime icing. Um, it can sometimes appear in different uh, uh, layers. So you'll get kind of an opaque look and more of a clear look. Um, it accumulates light clear, but it's more difficult to remove than, than rime ice. So those are the three main types of icing. And, um, and uh, let's see, we'll just head to the next slide, I guess. We'll, we'll keep this moving along here because I know we're, we're short on time. Um, ice uh, um, rates of accumulation range anywhere from a trace to severe. Um, trace typically not a big hazard. Um, any kind of de-icing or anti-icing should take care of it. Um, light icing. Um, you'll occasionally see some some de-icing needed, and if it uh, if you spend enough time in it, say you fly through a layer where um, it's not a, a thick layer, but you're going right smack dab flying through it for an extended period of time, say for like an hour, um, it can accumulate up to a point where it can become more of a uh, of a problem. Moderate ice um, in a shorter time, of course, it can become hazardous. Um, de-icing, changing your heading, altitude. Is typically going to be required and of course severe ice uh, is is uh, the no good one <laughs> de-icing isn't always going to be able to help out and uh, an immediate change of heading or altitude is is your best bet to try to uh, escape if you get into a layer of, of, uh, of uh, severe ice and again freezing rain would oftentimes fall into that category of severe ice uh, next slide <coughs> excuse me Synoptically, um, I'll go over this really quickly. Um, warm fronts can be a real problem area, and you might have some experience with that already. But if not, that's something to keep an eye out for. Um, when you have a warm front, and this A to B cross section here, we'll kind of we'll kind of advance this through here of the of the freezing level line that kind of gives you an idea north and south of where the freezing uh, the freezing temperatures are. And then let's advance one more if we could just to keep this moving. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, when you have a warm front, what you're often seeing is you're, um, you're getting um, warm air that's riding up and over colder air closer to the surface. Now, when the whole column is cold enough or below uh, freezing, below that uh, zero C, it's just going to be snow, of course. But you get anything beyond that, which is often the case in the, in the Midwest and heading eastward, and you can get into different types of precipitation. So freezing rain, um, ice pellets, different kinds of things. And of course, freezing rain is, is, the, big, uh, is the big threat when it comes to icing. So where you see that, uh, that uh, um, uh, red uh, shading in there is where you would expect to see some freezing rain and some, some pretty good icing potential. North of the warm front, and right along and into the cold sector, uh, right along and just north of where the uh, zero C uh, line is, the freezing uh, line is. So um, that's that's a, a real trouble spot, and uh, we see that quite a bit. There's other scenarios you can get along a cold front, um, but a warm front can be pretty prolific, and so it's something to keep an eye out for um, if you're going to be going up uh, in the colder season. That warm front lifting up. And out ahead of that to the north is where the icing can be pretty pretty bad. Uh, next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. Some interesting data here. Uh, I'll just go over this real quickly from AOPA, their accident analysis. Over a 10-year period, 54 uh, general aviation accidents 
uh, contributed to were were attributed to icing, and nearly half of those were fatal. Um, this applies just to small aircraft um, weighing less than 12,500 pounds or less. Um, nearly one quarter of all accidents um, uh, due to airframe icing was caused by ice, actually, or frost that accumulated on the ground and wasn't removed before the takeoff. So that's kind of an interesting tidbit. That's an important component. Um, nearly one quarter before they even got up in the air. And then, of course, uh, to, to main parts or components, carburetor induction icing can bring down three times as many airplanes as uh, just icing it, adhering to the skin of the aircraft. So that is that uh, is also a big, big caution to be taken there. Um, two thirds of all fatal icing accidents are due to build up on the airframe of the aircraft in flight. So still the the majority. But just wanted to throw out some of these tidbits because uh, they do remind us that icing can be a factor before you get airborne, and then of course once you're in the air, it can be. And it's not just on the the fuselage or on the uh, the the, uh, uh, the airframe of the aircraft. It can it can have other impacts as well to other components of the of the airplane. All right, next slide. So, <coughs> excuse me. Some mitigation um, procedures that you can take. These are these are fairly um, straightforward, so I'll go quickly over them. Ascending into a colder layer, colder than 20 C. Typically, your icing potential is greatest from zero C to, tw to minus 20 C, excuse me, I forgot the minus in there, minus 20 C. If you get a below, certainly your icing threat, of course, drops off when you're above freezing. You get above that, you can still have some icing, but typically it's gonna be on the light side to trace. So ascending into a colder layer, if you can, is typically the safest um, way to go to avoid any accumulation uh, potential of, of further ice. Descending in, uh, into a warmer layer below zero C, also if if you can, and that looks like the best route, um, can can is a is a good uh, mitigation uh, tactic to take. But you can sometimes pick up more ice. It sometimes is worse before it gets better. So that's to be used with a bit more caution than if you're going uh, ascending up into a colder layer. And then changing your header, lateraling into a fierce scattered deck, and trying to bust out of a broken overcast uh, is another a way to avoid further ice. Just wanted to mention cold skin, where the aircraft is already very cold before you take off. This can delay the warming of the aircraft, of course, and make the aircraft more susceptible to icing as you increase in moisture once you uh, get up in the air. So that's um, that's a mitigation to, to, to be aware of it all if, if de-icing is, is needed. Uh, next slide. All right, so we've already kind of talked about this some uh, previously, but with SIGMETs and AIRMETs, won't go over them again a ton, but <coughs> just to, to be brief, SIGMETs are a, a warning level um, product. So this is for severe conditions, um, they're issued and updated every, uh, well, issued every four hours, updated if need so, and if need be more than that. But those are to be taken pretty seriously for ICE. I would say very seriously for ICE. We don't issue a ton of SIGMETs for ICE, but when we do, um, it's because we're really worried about a sizable area where there's going to be um, some severe ICE, and that's to be taken very seriously. Um, Zulu AirMets uh, for ICE, this is an advisory level product for moderate icing. Um, it does include um, freezing levels in there, and that's issued every six hours. Next slide. And the last slide, I believe, here um, goes over the GFA. This is just to give you a look at if you're not familiar with it. Um, the, the blue boxes on there, uh, polygons rather, indicate where uh, we have an air met out for ice. So you can see up over the, uh, the lakes in the upper Midwest there and then over the Northeast. You can play around with um, your forecast time. You can play around with the levels, which is really nice. If there's a, 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 a some levels that you're going to be flying through that you're that you're most wanting to pinpoint, um, you can take a look at this tool. Handy, uh, really handy. Great for flight planning. Uh, great to just keep an eye on and get familiar with. So I encourage you to uh, to do that. And um, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and close with that. We're going to head on over to Turb. So at this point, I will toss it over to uh, Declan.
Okay, thanks a lot. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to everybody tonight about turbulence, uh, some timeline constrictions, so uh, we'll try to get through the material. Uh, very quickly, just a uh, <coughs> look at my experience. Uh, started uh, back in 1981 as a marine routing meteorologist in California, and then from that point on, took a, a, an interlude of about 22 years of broadcast uh, meteorology at the Weather Channel, also CBS affiliate in Birmingham, Alabama. And then after that, uh, into the public sector, where I've uh, enjoyed a very nice uh, career in the National Weather Service. I've worked at the Weather Prediction Center in uh, D.C., went to Duluth, Minnesota for eight years of wonder wonderful winter weather, and uh, now currently at uh, AWC as a senior av aviation meteorologist uh, for six years. So let's go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about uh, turbulence. So just a, a kind of a quick definition, irregular motion of the air resulting from eddies and vertical currents. And of course, you know, the, the nice part would be the days that you have laminar flow, kind of a equal wind field uh, up and down and horizontally. But in most cases, that's just a pipe dream. As we all know, as you've been out there flying, turbulence is uh, a lot more of a factor on any given day for some sections of the flight route. All right, let's see exactly how we can break this down because we do have a couple of levels of turbulence, different types, and also um, intensity. Now this is from the aeronautical information manual put out by the FAA, uh, kind of a, an attempt here to describe uh, both from the terms of aircraft behavior uh, and the in-cabin effect of uh, turbulence, the intensity of such. And you'll notice we have on the left the scale, light, moderate, severe, and extreme. Um, it's not out of the question. Uh, at times, we'll see uh, working at the AWC, we'll get a pie rep with extreme turbulence, uh, usually accompanied by a uh, editorial comment. Uh, in many cases, so perhaps heads hitting ceilings, uh, whatnot, not exactly the type of flight one wants to have, but uh, there it is. Um, we do also get reports and people ask us, well, what's CHOP? You know, how does CHOP differ different uh, from regular turbulence? And so what's going on with the CHOP is, is CHOP doesn't, let's say you have moderate CHOP versus just somebody reporting moderate turbulence. Well, by definition perspective, you'll notice here aircraft behavior, moderate, there's a change in the altitude and or the attitude of the aircraft with moderate turbulence. With moderate CHOP, it's more likely that you're not going to see any significant change in either one of those parameters. So that, that's kind of the loose and goosey of the difference between the chop. Uh, so um, again, if that does come up, that's, that's what we're looking at. Let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, next slide. So we're going to break this down a little bit here. There are several different ways that one can actually separate out turbulence due to diagnostics or, or cause, causation factors. Or, or levels, let's say low versus high. We'll take a look at a couple of these uh, in the interest of time constraint. We're not gonna spend much time on the next slide, which is the uh, convective um, aspect. This tends to be more of a seasonal summer um, uh, parameter, but I uh, just wanted to touch loosely on it. To the right, you see the diagram, which includes kind of the uh, who's who of bad guys when it comes to thunderstorm development. Wind shear quite likely at some time during the evolution of these uh, cumulonimbus clouds. Uh, on the outer flanks, we can have debris picked up, so we could have uh, visibility restrictions, outflow boundaries. Uh, we can have turbulence along the wind shear zones on those. We have roll clouds, uh, even in the cirrus blow off. A lot of research uh, recently. Uh, kind of uh, leading us to this idea that um, some of the uh, older school rules of thought as far as what distances we should maintain for safety of the flight, uh, those distances may have to be re-examined uh, based on some of the latest research uh, in the higher level uh, aspect of these uh, thunderstorms as the uh, blow off emanates out and we have what we call uh, gravity waves. Uh, literally uh, something similar to Let's say you threw a stone in a body of water in a lake and you see the rippling effect. Same thing goes on. The atmosphere behaves just like a fluid in many respects. So uh, we do have these little waves that emanate out from the updraft of the thunderstorm and they cause these ripples and turbulence along these gravity waves. And that's uh, one area where research has gone on quite extensively in the last uh, five to 10 years. Next slide. Okay, so low level turbulence. We'll talk more about that. And even though we are going into the, uh, the winter time mode and the sun doesn't have as much of an ability to uh, stretch 
uh, the boundary layer as much in the vertical, uh, we still can encounter these. We have what we call the dry thermals during the daytime. It's just simply the land is heated by the sun. The warm air above the land starts to rise and we get these so-called thermals. They can be very significant if you've uh, flown in the southwest, the height of those thermals uh, easily up over 14,000 feet. Uh, mechanical forcing, we'll talk a little bit about that. Simply the flow that's obstructed or changed when it encounters surface obstacles. And a lot of the times with turbulence, the turbulence can be modulated or uh, affected by several atmospheric parameters. How fast the ambience or the prevailing wind is, what kind of stability do you have that day? Is it a very unstable day? Is it a stable day, fair weather pattern? And also one big factor, terrain roughness can certainly uh, impact uh, the flight route. And typically this low level turbulence is within the planetary boundary layer. So that's the area that's effectively heated by the ground during the daytime. But it becomes a big factor during takeoff and landing, especially for the smaller aircraft. Okay. So we, we talk about low level turbulence. We can actually look at it from two perspectives, mechanical roughness of the surface or the thermal aspect, like the surface heating, as I've mentioned. And both of these contribute to a modification of the wind field at the surface. You take a look at the diagram on the right, notice the normal glide path that's illustrated in the solid line. Now let's say you're on final and you're coming in on the top frame and you, uh, your, your route takes you over rocky terrain and plowed ground. So the surface heating characteristics of that type of uh, land is certainly a lot different than let's say a body of water or even a wheat field. So those are the types of vertical or convective currents that could affect that glide path as you're coming in on your final. All right, our next slide is actually gonna talk a little bit about the thermal turbulence. Typical scenario here from left to right as time goes on, uh, the sun, as I mentioned, warms the ground. We get these little thermals, these bubbles of warm air that rise. But what you have to remember is it's not just simply a case of the warm air rising uh, upwards. As that warm air rises, it creates a vacuum. So the air surrounding that has to come in and fill it because the atmosphere is always trying to reach what we call homeostasis or equilibrium. And so in this constant uh, rising and then replenishing of the air, that's when we get all these changing air currents. So even then, even on a so-called fair weather day with rising cumulus clouds, there's, there's still a certain uh, amount of turbulence that has to be uh, contended with. All right, next slide. So this is kind of a simple view here. Um, if, if we have terrain where we have uneven surface heating, as I showed you, a body of water versus, a, let's say, a, a plowed field or a tarmac or a, a heavily urbanized area with lots of uh, cement, those different heating rates uh, cause different types of convective uh, towers. And so as a result, across uh, a given terrain here, you could actually encounter a variation in the turbulence uh, one of the more simple rules of thumb, and again, as we all know, um, a lot of times in meteorology, even in our numerical modeling, we're making assumptions to get to some final state or conclusion. Uh, this is the same scenario. You can uh, get into the lumps and bumps, uh, you know, below cloud base and the rising air and certainly into the cloud. And then as you get above that cloud base, they tend to find a little bit of a smoother flight above what we call the cumuloform clouds. However, to keep in mind, now that's not certainly going to be the case. If you have a, a significant convective tower, uh, then we could be looking at uh, a certainly a, a different scenario and a violation of that uh, particular rule of thumb. Next slide. So mechanical turbines. Uh, description here, kind of simplified, but it, it gets the point across. On the left, you see uh, airflow coming in from the left to right. It encounters a grove of trees, let's say, of a certain height. So the air is up and over, and then there's a kind of a tendency just downwind of the, let's say the forest canopy, where we have a, a rotation of the air down to the ground. Now let's just suppose that we increase the height of that blockage, uh, in this case, the trees. Now, not only do we have the up and over effect, but you notice the uh, circular kind of uh, rotating air column there just to the lee or to the uh, right side of that bigger tree. So this is the type of uh, mechanical turbulence we talk about. And on the right here, you can see kind of an accentuated uh, example of that, where we have two different sized buildings, uh, ambient flow coming in from left to right. And again, uh, just a whole variety of small scale circulation patterns and vertical and horizontal air currents that actually can affect uh, the surrounding terrain. And in this particular case, certainly 
a good aspect there on the runway. Next. So uh, next, I want to talk briefly about mountain wave turbulence. I, I wanted to show you the satellite picture on the right because it does a very good job of, of depicting this. And I mentioned earlier in the presentation this whole idea of uh, the gravity wave, the ripples in a lake from a stone being thrown in. And again, so here we have airflow coming over the Appalachians. Uh, you can see that very wave-like characteristic satellite signature that we see. Uh, in many cases, this can be an indication that we could be looking at uh, some turb, especially I notice a lot of times in this particular case, the Shenandoah Valley in Western Virginia, very prone to these wave-like motions from the uh, mountain waves. Now, this is a kind of a smaller scale. Folks in the West like to joke about the Eastern uh, mountains as being just little hills. Uh, and in terms of elevation, certainly the case. You go to the west and in the Rockies, uh, these mountain waves can extend to very high levels through the entire trope, uh, even up into the lower stratosphere. Uh, we can get these gravity or lee waves at all altitudes, uh, but in particular, especially um, in the east and also for parts of the Rockies and plains of Colorado, you can get these hydraulic jumps or these rotors that form uh, just east of the mountain range. So certainly any type of mountain flying that you uh, plan on doing it's a whole new ball game uh, because the ability of terrain to induce uh, some pretty dramatic changes in the air characteristics uh, is, is quite large. Next slide. Uh, then we of course have a little more common, uh, common maybe to a lot of people's perspective, frontal turbulence, uh, warm air uh, being lifted uh, along that up wide slope that uh, we just saw in the icing presentation uh, with Mitch. Uh, also uh, commonly associated with cold fronts, particularly strong ones. Uh, the convection that can occur in the strong winds, typically ahead of an approaching strong cold front, all of these things can contribute to issues uh, with maintaining control of the aircraft. Next. So here's an example, of warm air, uh, kind of a warm frontal uh, situation. Going up in height on the left here, temperatures increasing with height as this is an inversion. And these inversions are, are very uh, problematic in a, in a kind of a narrow corridor. It's right along that interface where the temperature stops its uh, rise, uh, steadies, and then drops uh, again as it typically would as you're going aloft. Uh, and what we'll find is that uh, typically in the fall, this time of year, we get the nighttime radiational cooling, temperatures drop dramatically, uh, warmer air and still more wind flow aloft, so things are mixed up better so it doesn't drop and we end up with this thermal or temperature profile that you see here. And right along that inversion interface is where we have these uh, eddies and the wind shear can actually be quite significant, uh, even in one of these, what we would normally consider just a general uh, nocturnal radiation inversion. So that's certainly something you need to be aware of if you're flying at that time of the day. Also, one uh, interesting aspect, when these inver inversions break, typically uh, it takes a few hours for the sun to heat the ground to get things mixed up enough in the lower layers, but it's not uncommon that we can have a rapid fluctuation and a sudden gust of wind and let's say a 15 to 30 minute window when these inversions, uh, what we call break, as the mixing starts to extend to a much uh, greater depth of that vertical column. Okay, next. So the wind shear we talked about along these frontal zones, you can have in the vertical now, in all three examples here, you can see we can have the directional shear that occurs along these frontal boundaries. Speed shear, you don't have to have it. If you have significant uh, change in wind speed in a very short distance with height, uh, that's a big issue. And then in some cases you get the double whammy where you have both a strong speed and directional shear. And all of these uh, frontal wind shear patterns can uh, certainly cause a lot of trouble for aviators. Next. So we'll talk a little bit about clear air turbulence. Um, not as much of a factor if we're, we're down below 15,000 MSL. Uh, once you get above that, and especially now as we go into the winter season, uh, flights above that level, we're looking very carefully in the vicinity of the jet streams, the tropopause, any upper level fronts uh, we can find. These tend to be the neighborhoods where these uh, clear air turbulence uh, features hang out. Uh, one of the problems with forecasting turbulence, uh, temporally, spatially, this is a very limited phenomenon. As we all know, you're in an aircraft, you hit turbulence, it's here and it's gone, uh, usually in a very short period of time. Almost akin to a needle in a haystack when you're trying to forecast these things. What we do know from the science part is that there are certain patterns that are conducive 
to producing uh, turbulence. Having said that, doesn't necessarily it occurs every time that pattern presents itself, and that's the challenge uh, to the meteorologist. Uh, these clear air turbulence uh, features. Uh, certainly can occur uh, in the upper trope, even into the lower stratosphere. Thankfully, with the research that's been ongoing, we've had a lot more of, uh, I guess, of the inroad into trying to forecast these things with a little more accuracy. Next. So uh, aircraft-induced turbulence, so the wake forecast, uh, mainly a concern, of course, near the airports. Uh, if you're trailing a big guy, you've got a heavy taken off in front of you, and I think everybody uh, involved in aviation learns that pretty quick. Uh, but we can still get a significant number of these encounters that can occur at the upper levels as well. Uh, and so uh, you can go ahead and roll that video, I think, if our magnificent production crew uh, can go ahead and give us this. Now, this is an exaggerated. Uh, we've got a big C5A, I believe it is. Uh, we got the smoke set up on the layers in the vertical along that tower, and then we can see a pretty uh, dramatic colorized version of the wake vortex. But again, same phenomena that you're going to encounter if you're trailing heavy and you're coming in on your smaller aircraft and you've got these wake vortexes or wake vortices, uh, certainly can be a big, big factor in control of the aircraft. All right, uh, thanks for the video. And uh, I believe we have uh, another slide, the last one. This will be Okay, where can you get some turbulence information? Now, the good thing is here, this is the GTG, the Graphical Turbulence uh, Guidance. This has been an ongoing effort since 2003. So we're up at like year 17 in the development of this product. A very good, I would strongly recommend you take some time, like a lot of meteorological products. Uh, it gets better as you spend more time with it in terms of you getting comfortable with how to use it. The first few times may be a little rough, uh, you can pick your aircraft type there on the left. Uh, in, in the case for most of us tonight, I believe, you know, that's going to be light. And then what you do is you pick your vertical level of interest or interest if you're going through several layers there and you want to check each one out. And this actually is, it has the ability, you can break it down to um, clear air or mountain wave. Um, it used to be in the earlier iterations of this software that it would only handle uh, certain layers above like 15. Uh, but since uh, the last five years or so, uh, there's now a much better uh, product that's able to detail this down to much lower levels. Uh, you can go from 1,000 to flight level 45, uh, 18 hours forecast that'll go out. It's updated every hour. It runs off what we call the uh, RAP model, uh, which uh, incorporates the latest satellite uh, radar, and also more importantly, it's taking in all the latest pilot reports and using that to nudge or adjust the ongoing model run uh, to better fit the reality. So uh, it's a very good product. I strongly recommend that uh, you take the chance uh, or take the opportunity to go in and look at it. And you'll notice like a lot of our products in the upper right, there's an info button. You can toggle on that and it'll give you the complete lowdown. It's quite, it's quite sophisticated because we've got actually different parameters that we look at. We call them diagnostics, but there's uh, different ones for different layers of the atmosphere. So it's not just one big broad brush paint for the whole uh, surface to 45 layer. It's, it's broken down to where it intelligently assesses uh, the layers based on our latest research as to what is most important in that particular layer. And I believe that's uh, the end for me. Uh, apologize for the rapidity of the uh, presentation there, though, but in the respect of time, I uh, wanted to give Joey a chance. And also, uh, is, of course, anytime you can just give us uh, questions, email me, uh, and I'll be glad to uh, answer any of your questions. Joey? All right, well, thank you, Declan, and thank you for hanging out with us thus far. I know it's gone a little over, but uh, I am the last section. Um, then we'll have a quick Q&A, and we'll be wrapped up. Uh, I do want to talk briefly on uh, ceilings, visibility, and precipitation, specifically when it comes to winter weather and some of those hazards that you can encounter over the next several months. Um, go ahead, uh, next slide, please. So we'll uh, take a look at ceilings, uh, what forms, clouds, how that whole process um, commences, in, in a nutshell, uh, basically we won't go into cloud physics or anything like that, but. Uh, We'll, we'll look at what are the determining factors for reduced visibility in ceiling heights. Uh, basically, the cloud base or, or ceiling height is determined by the height in which air condenses and becomes saturated. Uh, in a nutshell, rising air cools to the point of condensation. And if you have enough rising motion and enough moisture vertically stacked, 
uh, a variety of cloud types will form over a given area. You know, you can think of this in terms of stratiform cloud types versus convective cloud types in two basic forms. Uh, cloud types are also dependent on seasonality, geographic location, and atmospheric locations, or atmospheric conditions as well. Uh, slide, please. So if you take a look at this example, uh, this is from Grand Forks. Uh, you can see the METAR there uh, shows a broken cloud layer at 7,000 feet. Uh, it's important to note that any ceilings that you see in METAR data are reported in AGL, above ground level. Uh, so in this case, uh, the cloud base is actually at 7,845 feet mean sea level. Uh, once we factor in the field elevation of 845 feet, we get the broken at 070 that you'll see in the METAR. Next slide, please. And one of the tools that we use to forecast ceiling heights are gonna be the QT diagrams. So a lot of you have seen these. I think I saw a question about that in the chat there. Uh, but basically, they depict a vertical profile of temperature and dew point trends. Uh, here you can see the, the red line representing temperature, uh, the green line, of course, representing dew point. There's a lot of other data that's depicted here, but for the sake of time, we'll just talk about temperature and dew point. Uh, in this particular case, we'll see a saturated layer, uh, pretty low, uh, roughly between 5,000 and 7,000 feet. And this is the kind of data we look at to determine ceiling heights. We can also look at this data in hourly increments uh, with high-res guidance, which is invaluable for forecasting trends and ceiling heights over a given location. And again, this, this represents a point, so it's not a, a, um, a, a big spatial outlook of trends, but we can look at many different points to see what the trends are to kind of time the arrival of lower ceiling heights, that kind of a thing. So this is an invaluable tool for us and, uh, and a lot of our TAF forecasts uh, in aviation products come from this type of model data. Uh, next slide. So let's switch gears and speak briefly on what factors come into play with reduced visibility, uh, namely fog and precipitation for this discussion. Uh, fog's a pretty complicated beast. Uh, it, it forms in different ways. Uh, here are a few examples of, of how it typically forms. Uh, in our first case here, uh, radiation fog is probably what you're gonna see in most cases. Uh, it basically forms from heat stored in the Earth's very shallow layer at the surface uh, that radiates upward at night. Um, it, this in turn cools the layer just above the surface until the point it reaches condensation. Uh, this is most common on clear nights, uh, oftentimes right after precipitation uh, exits the area, high pressure builds into the area, so you have a very surface, a moist surface. Uh, once you start cooling that, you, you saturate pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, the next example is uh, common in terrain uh, with upslope fog. Uh, it develops basically as a stable moist layer, slowly moves over terrain and is forced upward. And the same thing happens. Uh, it reaches uh, condensation and begins to saturate that, uh, that area. And finally, advection fog forms when a moist layer moves into a cooler environment over land or water. Uh, in the Kansas City area, Interestingly enough, this is most often occurring when uh, when you have southerly winds advecting into an area where snowpack is present. Usually, you have to have you know an inch or more of snow on the ground, but um, it's it's pretty neat to see you know uh, terrain uh, the surface covered with snow, and then all of a sudden you've got fog developing over the area, and it actually helps to melt the snow. Um, but that's that's advection fog in a nutshell. Uh, next slide, please. And the final cause for reduced visibility and or ceiling heights is going to come in the form of precipitation and precipitation type, particularly as we head into the winter months. Uh, so precipitation type, as you know, it's critical and can be difficult to forecast given the multiple factors at play. It's not black and white as liquid precip is. Uh, so let's look at the difference in precipitation types to see what's going on and what causes everything in the spectrum from rain to a wintry mix all the way to snow. Uh, so if you look on the far left, a lot of you guys have seen this graphic before, um, but this kind of generalizes a lot of this, but it does help to explain what's going on thermally. 
so if you look in the far left, you'll see the very simple case of, of all rain. Um, this, this basically occurs when you have a very sufficiently deep warm layer where any frozen precipitation melts and remains melted and it reaches the ground as uh, liquid precip. Um, going over to the next example, you have a sufficient warm layer that is able to fully melt any frozen precipitation, uh, but then it goes back into a sub-freezing layer at, near the surface. And you basically form super cooled water that freezes on contact with any surface objects. Going a little bit further to the right, uh, we still have the warm layer present, kind of complicating things. So you have frozen precip that partially melts and then fully refreezes in that sufficiently deep sub-freezing cold layer. Um, and it forms sleet. And of course, you've got ice accumulation just the same as you do freezing rain at the surface. Uh, and then going back to the simpler scenarios, uh, anytime we have a completely uh, below freezing column, we have all snow, and that's obviously not going to accumulate ice unless you have above freezing surface temperatures initially. Um, but you know, as as you're flying, it's it's not as simple as what you'd see at the surface. You can quickly go from one regime to another, uh, and you can actually fly through these processes it's, as they are happening, and you can quickly get ice built up, uh, like Mitch was talking about earlier. Uh, so it's certainly worth keeping an eye out for when you're flight planning to, to keep in mind any areas of you know, mixed precip or a transition area that you're going to be flying through, uh, because what, uh, what you see at the surface is not always what you get at the, uh, at the upper levels. Uh, next slide, please. So with freezing rain having significant impacts to aviation operations, uh, this is a quick display of a study from 2003 uh, showing the frequency of freezing rain events over the US. Uh, the number of days may be a little bit hard to see, uh, but in the northern and central plains, especially across the northeast, freezing rain events typically occur anywhere from three to seven days uh, in a given winter season. And obviously this can wreak a lot of havoc to aviation operations. Uh, these are only averages and numbers may be much higher for a given area uh, in a given winter season. Next slide, please. And we'll take another quick look at visibility reductions during winter precipitation, which are directly related to precipitation intensity. Uh, intensity is going to be dependent on the amount of rising motion that you have and the amount of moisture supply that you are, are given over a particular region. And typically speaking, we can kind of generalize here, and this changes a lot, but you know, in a given hour, but typically speaking, light snow reduces visibility down to two to three miles. Uh, but as soon as you get into the heavier snowfall, you can reduce uh, visibility down to one mile or less. Uh, and it's important to note, you know, for flight planning purposes, you can always use TAFs at your departure and arrival locations to anticipate visibility trends and expectations. Uh, some airports, especially smaller airports, may not have a TAF, uh, TAF issuance at all, but you can use nearby airports, you know, to kind of get the feel for, you know, expected trends over that given location. And I believe that's all I have. Next slide. And we will turn it over to Amanda one more time for some more Q&A. All right, thank you guys for uh, sticking with us through the second session. Um, if I could get Joey back up here, Declan, I see Mitch is already on. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to give you each one and then the rest, uh, we'll go ahead and put up a slide after this that shows emails and you can go ahead and um, um, email your questions uh, there and we can answer those. So uh, Mitch, I've got one for you regarding mixed icing and uh, what conditions will typically produce that mixed icing scenario. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, I mean, maybe others can chime on this as well if they have any input on this. Um, um, it's, 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 as best I could explain it, um, a, a mixture, you can get different conglomerates of, 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 uh, of uh, preset types. 
super cool droplets and then you get uh, into different you know thermal regimes um, typically it's going to be kind of a, a more uneven atmosphere thermally where you're getting where you're getting different types of of, of, of either precipitation or super cold water different sizes of that um, freezing rain um, of course um, trying to think of anything else I don't know if anybody else wants to chime in on that but that would and that would be kind of the simple way that I'd answer that. Yeah, I think the the whole the whole spectrum of super cold liquid and how it evolves and behaves in terms of the ice nucleation process is is a conundrum. But um, I would think the variation between let's say rhyme and clear or mixed rhyme and clears is just that combination of microphysics within the cloud or super cool super cool liquid layer uh, on any given day. And and I would note it's you know it's tough for us to we don't we don't forecast we forecast for icing potential and the threat with it but we we don't differentiate um, when we're when we're drawing our air mats and and all that um, and issue our product we don't we don't pinpoint on the areas of all those three different icing types that gets into really murky water that we just. I can, I can step in just and kind of help yeah. out a little bit. Uh, in the Air Force, when we would do icing, we would have to do the type as well uh, with mm -hmm. forecasting. And typically what we would look for is icing conditions between minus 8 and minus 15 Celsius. So when you get into that temperature range, that was typically what we would utilize as forecasters to say mixed as opposed to rhyme or clear. So that's what we used to use. Thank you, Mitch and Jimmy, for answering that. Um, next, I'm going to give one to Declan. Um, it says, the rule of thumb I heard years ago, crosswinds over mountains in excess of 20 knots tend to reduce significance and building turbulence, like rotors, for example. Is that still a good one? Um, like a lot of attempts in complicated sciences to um, come up with rules of thumb, uh, it's it can be valid, but with a big caveat that it's not just the wind flow over the terrain, but also the direction, the more perpendicular to the flow, the more enhanced the ability. But all of this wind mechanical obstruction generation of the current is all being, um, it's all occurring in an envelope of the atmosphere and it's the stability or the instability at that particular time that allows the wave to then take on its characteristic result. So uh, I would say in, in direct answer to the, the question, uh, generally as forecasts of turbulence, when we're looking at low level turbulence, we, we actually look at 25 knots, maybe a little higher. Um, so I, I, you know, 20 knots is probably okay on, to be on the cautious side, but again, 25 knots or higher, especially if it's, perpendicular to the actual terrain orientation, I think is, is kind of the way you want to go. But again, a lot of this is, is also dependent on the stability characteristics of, of the atmosphere that given day. Thank you, Declan. Okay, and we'll go ahead and uh, give this one to Joey. When hearing surface, how high above ground level does the surface go to or is considered? Uh, any, anywhere that you're located on the ground is, is representative of the surface. Um, it's something we have to keep in mind for mountainous areas uh, because, you know, the freezing layer you know, in western Kansas may be, you know, 7,000 feet, but as soon as you go into Colorado, now you're above the freezing layer. Um, so I, I don't know if I'm understanding the question exactly, but it's when, when we refer to the surface, uh, we're referring to um, AGL, uh, regardless of, of MSL. Yep, I think that was it. So there's a couple more questions. I think we'll go ahead again in the interest of time. Uh, you guys can email us. Um, I'm seeing a lot of thank yous as well. Um, and thank you guys for coming. I'll let Jonathan uh, close us out, but I'll go ahead and uh, we'll, uh, we'll let Jonathan finish us off and um, we'll answer questions. And if you guys have any other questions, go ahead and email. Um, all of our information is there.
Awesome. Thanks, Amanda. And thanks uh, to the session two presenters. Really appreciate your insight. And and uh, we're going to try to capture all the questions that are flowing into the chat room. It's uh, it's really awesome to see your interest level and in what we're doing here. So we really appreciate your attendance. Um, I would like to acknowledge a few folks uh, who have helped make this a success for us. Uh, again, keep Peters, uh, appreciate uh, Evan Doss and Chris Irish for uh, working with us, helping us launch this endeavor. Uh, it's been a vision of ours to really increase the outreach in the Kansas City area, and we're kind of uniquely positioned to having three different aviation offices, kind of the, the triad of aviation in KC. So it's really cool that we can uh, we can partner with you to do this. So I uh, really appreciate your support there. You can follow them on Facebook. There's their address. Uh, I'd also like to throw out a big shout out to Ron Moyers. He's an executive officer at AWC. He's also a NOAA Corps pilot. And uh, he's been helping us out with some of the behind the scenes work. Uh, Jimmy, thank you again from uh, from uh, WFO Pleasant Hill. Appreciate your time there. And also Jennifer Zeltwanger, who is the uh, meteorologist in charge over at the uh, uh, city of issue in Olathe. So I appreciate your support. And also Ryan Solomon, who's a science and operations officer at AWC, working some behind the scenes. Uh, if you'd like to follow us on social media, there's our handle. Uh, we're very active there as well. Amy and Amanda do a lot of great work there. Uh, and I appreciate uh, your comments and, you know, uh, any questions that you might have for us, we'll, we'll certainly follow up with that. So again, uh, thank you very much for your time tonight. We are a little bit over scheduled, but that's okay because we always believe in flight safety and uh, getting you the best information is our most important job. So uh, with that, we'll close out for tonight and uh, have a great evening. Thank you very much for joining.